Uh, good morning, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to Grand Rounds. Today we have a special guest speaker, Dr. Faharjadeh. I did it right. Okay, and uh, his credentials, he's from the uh, Department of Radiology. He graduated from New York Medical College, did his radiology residency at St. Vincent Hospital, Massachusetts, and a fellowship in pediatric radiology at Children's National Medical Center. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, I, I have a mic. So hopefully everybody can hear me. Okay, good. All right, so my talk is the basics of chest x-ray and ionizing radiation. Um, I just wanted to uh, give some special thanks to uh, Ali Amin and Kate Wagner. They helped uh, come up with some of the slides for the chest x-ray lecture. So I have no disclosures that I know of. So the first thing I want to talk about is the difference between a PA versus an AP. And PA just means uh, the direction that the x-ray beam is headed, uh, posterior to anterior, whereas AP is anterior to posterior. I'll have a slide. The next slide will show kind of what I'm talking about. Um, but basically, the PA source is uh, further away from the patient, making the images sharper. It's about six feet away from the patient, um, as opposed to an AP, which is about 40 inches away from the patient. So it actually makes it sharper having a PA radiograph. A lot of these principles are uh, based similar to the principles of light. So if you want to practice it, you can actually take a flashlight and a table and see some of the same principles uh, for x-ray. They, they stay the same. Um, the closer you move your hand, of course, to the table, the better and sharper your images get also, so you get less magnification. And that, so the AP source, as we talked about, is closer. Um, we talked about magnification of the heart, so it's AP, so the beam is heading from anterior to posterior, and the heart is an anterior structure, so that causes the magnification. Give you falsely elevated heart sizes. Um, generally, the AP chest x-ray should be reserved for sick or bedridden patients or very young children. Uh, the PA is, and lateral is a much better series to be getting on normal patients or patients who are okay. So this is just an example of the PA technique. This is the x-ray tube where the x-rays are generated. So the x-ray beam is going to head this way, posterior to anterior, making the PA. And you see this is the detector or the film, and the heart is right up against the detector and the film, so you get less magnification and you get a better look at the heart size. So the lateral view. The convention is that the patient's left side is closest to the film or detector, so the left ribs are, again, less magnified than the right. So when you're looking at a lateral chest radiograph, the ribs that are bigger, those are the right ribs. Um, it's really important and helps uh, find things like retrocardiac pneumonias and things like that, especially uh, behind the left heart. Um, it can really be uh, a useful tool because sometimes on an AP radiograph, you could miss a left lower lobe pneumonia or a retrocardiac pneumonia. It's also very good for picking up pleural effusions. Uh, it's a little bit more sensitive with the lateral than just the frontal views, and especially vertebral body fractures and lesions. We miss a lot of those if all you have is a frontal radiograph. So this is just a nice example. So this is a PA chest radiograph. You can see how the heart size looks normal, the mediastinal silhouette looks normal. This is an AP radiograph one day earlier. Heart looks borderline enlarged. Mediastinal silhouette looks a little big. So it kind of proves the point. And if you've got a lateral with this, this really helps out. Um, you'll notice that when you order a lot of chest radiographs, the PAs oftentimes look a lot, lot better. Um, this is um, uh, the importance of a lateral. You'll see it on the next slide. Um, but this is a, a child who came in with respiratory symptoms. And I don't know if you can see it, but there's this kind of like bubbly, patchy, lucency, it looks kind of like it could be loculated. Can, anybody, can everybody see that? Or is it difficult? Right there. So 
we were wondering what this was. This is a, a, an abdominal x-ray about two years earlier. You don't see anything like this in that same area. We got a lateral, clearly shows us what it is. So this is herniating large bowel. Um, this was a Morgagni hernia that was causing this. So we, we solved the problem with the lateral. All right, importance of rotation. Um, this, uh, the, the patient had a central line placed, a left-sided central venous line. The patient's a little bit tilted. You can see the heart looks kind of funny. The mediastinum looks widened. Actually, a mediastinal hemorrhage was questioned, but we weren't really sure if this was really real or was it, we thought it was most likely due to rotation. Chest radiograph, a few hours later on the same day, looks okay. So, and the line was fine in position. So, lobar anatomy, there are three lobes in the right lung and two in the left. Um, lobes are divided into anatomic segments, each supplied by its own bronchus or blood vessels. I'm not going to go into segmental anatomy, that's more for radiology residents and radiologists, but I will go into the lobar anatomy. Um, this is just a great anatomic sl uh, slide. You see this is the right upper lobe, right middle lobe. This is the minor fissure or horizontal fissure. This is the lateral view, the right upper lobe, right middle lobe, horizontal fissure. This is the right lower lobe. And the key point is I want people to see how far superiorly the right lower lobe extends. So with the lateral, it can a lot of times help us. And especially picking up pneumonias, um, as you go down the spine, you, should, you shouldn't see it getting denser. You can pick up a lot of retrocardiac pathology, too. This is just a, an anatomy picture of the left upper lobe. You can see the left upper lobe. This is the oblique fissure or major fissure of the left lobe. And again, how far superior the left lower lobe goes. This is a nice case of a low bar pneumonia. You can see um, there's a significant airspace opacity or airspace disease in the right lung base. You have the lateral view. You can clearly tell it's in the right middle lobe. There's some bulging, uh, basically, uh, pleural fissures. And this ended up being a Klebsiella pneumonia. Now, this is more classic for peds. So you have a round lesion in the right lower lung. Based on the lateral, you can clearly tell it's in the right lower lobe, and this was a round pneumonia. Now, the reason you get round pneumonias in kids, and generally we see it before eight, but definitely we shouldn't start seeing it after 12, is because kids have uh, pores of sun and canals of Schlem that haven't quite developed, so they tend to get these pneumonias that can look like masses. Now, on any of these things, I would still get a chest radiograph in about six weeks to document it goes away. Just make sure there's nothing in there. So this is just a nice case of atelectasis, which we see all the time. This is some subsegmental or plate-like atelectasis. And then this is a chest radiograph where it looks kind of like plate-like. Now, these are more difficult cases of atelectasis. This looks like a pneumonia, um, significant opacity with air bronchograms, it looks like a consolidation, CT, airspace, significant airspace opacity, air bronchograms. Now, this is a key point. Contrast shouldn't only be reserved for PE studies or CTA studies or aorta. If for infections, it can sometimes be very helpful. So this lung parenchyma is completely opacified, but the lung parenchyma is enhancing. So this is atelectasis. This is not pneumonia. These little things are basically uh, bronchioles or bronchi that are filled with fluid. This, on the other hand, this, again, you see the airspace opacity on the lung windows, this on the soft tissue windows, and again, luckily contrast was given. The lung parenchyma is not enhancing. So this is airspace disease. Most of the time, airspace disease means pneumonia. It can mean things like pus, blood, water, other things, even tumor, but usually it's, it's pneumonia. 
I just want to just see that and that. All right. So lobar anatomy, the lungs, uh, the lobes of the lungs are lined by visceral and parietal pleura, which is normally not visualized. Fissure anatomy may have anatomic variations and may not be complete. Uh, the most common variant I see is an azygous fissure. It's an incidental finding in the right of the lung. I'm not going to really go into that. But so again, the minor fissure or the horizontal fissure, the major fissure on the right lung or the oblique fissure. And again, the left generally just has a major fissure or an oblique fissure. This is a little bit difficult to see. I will have the next slide we'll show you, but these are basically the oblique fissures. And they're a little thickened because there's a little bit of edema outlining them. So this patient had a little bit of uh, CHF. Um, this is a, another case of CHF or pulmonary edema. You can see the, the pulmonary vessels are pretty prominent. This is a magged in view uh, on the lateral. And you see these like linear things that kind of look like atelectasis, but given this, these are curly B-lines that go along with um, pulmonary edema. And the, curly, or the A lines are basically the classic ones that we see that are perihilar. And then this is later where they probably got some diuretics or latex and got better. This is a nice anatomy slide where you see the lateral right costophrenic angle, lateral left costophrenic angle, and the cardiophrenic angle. And this is a lateral showing you the posterior costophrenic angle. So a key point here is on the AP view, you generally need about 200 cc's to see pleural effusions. With If you get a lateral, you only need about 50 cc's to see a pleural effusion. Just uh, a case of CHF, and you can see the posterior pleural effusion or blunting. Here you could maybe question it, but it's clearly there. So this was a small left. This is a great anatomy slide. Um, key point here is the left ventricle makes up the majority of the left heart border. Right atrium makes up the majority of the right heart border. And then you can see other major pieces of anatomy like the aortic arch of structures. This is the lateral view, a really nice anatomy picture. It's something that I sometimes even refer to when I'm at work if I have a difficult case. I'll sometimes pull up the slide. but. Uh, the major thing is the right ventricle is the most anterior structure in the heart. The left atrium is the most posterior structure. So sometimes when you have uh, left atrial enlargement, what you're going to see is actually this bulging and pushing into the airways. And then there are other major structures that you can see that are outlined on the plane film. All right, so just talking about pick lines. Um, so. This is a pick line, and it's, the tip is overlying the inferior SVC, which is fine. Um, this is outlining the superior atrial cable junction, and it's just a nice diagram of the superior atrial cable junction is approximately two vertebral bodies away from the carina. Um, now, for adults, it's not as critical with a pick line, but for children, it is, because if you do get the pick line too far into the right atrium, it can move around and actually cause perforation of the heart and hemopericardium. So you don't really want to do that. Um, <laughs> uh, with adults, it's generally not as risky. But so I, I, a saying I like is don't let perfection be the enemy of excellence. So if you get it into the SVC, you're good. And it's, so it's directed downward going with gravity. And one of the tricks uh, one of the IR docs uh, taught me who was placing these, uh, the pediatric IR doc, or interventional radiology doc, is that if you get it near the right main stem bronchus, you're good. Like a little bit above, a little bit below, directly on, you're fine. Okay, so you don't need to get it perfectly in the superior atrial cable junction. And this is also showing the inferior atrial cable junction. Um, I usually like to go by eyeball. I don't give uh, levels because I don't know if you've heard the saying, I ate 10 eggs at 12, or the different things for when they're passing the, the hiatus of the diaphragm, but I ate is basically IVC going at T8. This is not T8. 
So um, I go around here, it looked okay. If you get it a little bit into the intrahepatic IVC, you're still fine. All right. This is just a, a nice anatomy slide where you can see the venous, the major venous anatomy of the chest. So this is the left, I mean, right subclavian vein, right IJ, where, they, where the two meet is the right brachiocephalic vein. This is the left subclavian vein, where these two meet is the left IJ, becomes the left brachiocephalic vein. Where the right brachiocephalic and left brachiocephalic mean, that's the SVC. And you can see, if you get it near the uh, right main stem bronchus, you're good. So this is an interesting case, <laughs> something that we commonly see. So this is a left subclavian line. It has flipped the wrong way, which oftentimes happens, and it's actually in the left IJ. So this had to be removed in place. Um, this is an interesting case of uh, a wire that was somehow left or was lost in the patient, and it was extending from the right femoral vein going all the way up to IVC and eventually terminating in the right brachiocephalic vein. So they had to smear that. Um, endotracheal tubes. Um, for adults, I like to generally see the endotracheal tube between three and eight centimeters uh, above the carina. For pediatric patients, the main point is, is I want to see it about the mid-trachea level. Um, sometimes uh, I see you, when they're really ventilating a kid, um, wants it a little bit closer to the carina. Can't tell, but uh, the main point is you want it around the mid trachea, and this is uh, a diagram basically showing you how, with different neck positions, it can change the ET two position. So this is flexion where it moves it too low. This is neutral where it's where it's supposed to be, and then this is extended where it pulls it back. Um, the main thing with endotracheal tubes, you don't want it at the carina, and you don't want it in the right main stem bronchus. Uh, because it tends to go down the right main stem bronchus because it's a little bit straighter. That's why patients also tend to aspirate more on the right side. All right. Enteric tube or NG tubes. Um, this is just an example of uh, an enteric tube with the tip overlying the gastric fundus. See the stomach bubble, air bubble by the fundus. Um, this is an interesting case of an enteric tube or an NG tube, which is taking an abnormal course and going, does anybody want to take this case? Anyway. No? It like yes, it's going into a bronchus. So it's going, it's, go, it's interesting, so this is an NG tube. It's going down the trachea, it's going into the left main stem bronchus, it's curling back, and then going down the right main stem bronchus. So you would never want to feed through that too. So, <laughs> um, no, no, I, I think they, it just went into the trachea to begin with. So it kind of, you, I actually had a case of that uh, yesterday where it, it just went down the left main stem bronchus. So, um, now this is uh, an enteric tube and the tip looks okay. It's in the gastric body. But this is a critical point. Some of these uh, enteric tubes have side ports where a lot of the feed comes through. So this is near the GE junction. I don't know what's going on. Um, where it's near the GE junction. So this would be okay for suction, depending on your purposes. But for feeding, you can get reflux with this and sometimes aspiration. Actually, when I do some of my upper GI series, you can actually see it, uh, have, uh, the reflux happen. All right, so We're back online. Back online. Okay. So this is the last slide I was at. Um, here you basically see a moderate-sized pneumothorax. You can see the pleural line. There's no lung markings beyond it, and it's also extending down here. 
patient had uh, significant uh, central lobular and paracephal emphysema, so probably ruptured one of these and had the pneumothorax. This is um, a large pneumothorax, and there's shift of the heart and the mediastinum to the right, so this was a tension uh, from subclavian and line placement. Um, this is an even more severe uh, pneumothorax, and there's an effusion, a pleural effusion right there, and you can see significant collapse of the left lung and shift, so this was an even more severe tension pneumothorax. And this actually ended up being blood. I guess the patient was stabbed um, at the pneumothorax. So these are all critical findings. Okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, this is, <laughs> just to put it out there, um, this is a case of pneumomediastinum. A lot of times, pneumomediastinum is hard to pick up if you don't have this finding, which is, now you see there's a little bit of air around the, the mediastinum, but really what you see is a lot of the air around the neck and the subcutaneous soft tissue. Um, so that's a lot of times you're finding. Um, this is just the CT correlate showing how much air is actually inside the soft tissues of the neck. Um, the main thing with pneumomediastinum is there's a risk for pneumothorax. So um, you want to make sure that the patient doesn't develop a pneumothorax. It can be easily, uh, you know, uh, one can lead to the other. So you want to follow these patients. They generally resolve within four to 14 days. And the most common reason for it is rupture of an airway or, or the Macklin effect. A lot of times you have COPD ears or asthmatics or coughing or somebody's coughing very heavily and uh, they rupture small airway and it starts dissecting into the mediastinum. Um, a lot of times I have gotten esophagrams for this. If the patient doesn't have a serious history of retching or vomiting, you don't have Borhobs, and usually with Borhobs you would have a left-sided pleural effusion because um, that's oftentimes where the esophagus likes to perforate. Um, but I've had a bunch of esophagrams done for stuff like this, and it was just because the patient was coughing. So. Uh, you know, one the conference is now in talk mode. Somebody. The conference is now in silent mode. The password and over and over. So this is uh, a sad case. Um, this is a case of child abuse. Um, you can see uh, a series of posterior medial acute rib fractures bilaterally. Um, you can see some uh, subacute or healing fractures bilaterally, particularly on this side. And then you can see some more chronic posterior medial with more well-formed callus. So the posterior medial fractures are almost pathognomonic for child abuse because the mechanism is somebody is actually squeezing the chest and breaking the posterior ribs. And then fractures of different age, ages is a very bad sign. And uh, sadly, uh, babies are the most susceptible to this. So recommended reading, uh, Felsen's uh, Principles of Chest Rankinology or Radiography. I would highly recommend this book. Uh, it takes one or two days to read. Um, I would, if you're an intern or anything, I would get it. I would put it with the rapid interpretation of EKG book. They're both excellent, great for intern year. Because um, when I was in internal medicine, I had to read my own chest x-rays. Um, and actually, the first people to teach me how to read chest x-rays were my internal medicine doc. Um, so now we're just going to digress into radiation, a talk on ionizing radiation. So there's two main effects when I talk about uh, ionizing radiation. There's deterministic effects and stochastic effects. Deterministic effects are radiation changes that happen soon after radiation exposure and are directly correlated with the exposure. So um, they tend to happen hours to a few weeks after the uh, incident. And there's always a minimal threshold dose that is pretty significant for you to see any changes. Um, I personally have only seen one case of this, and it was, you know, an interventional radiology, and, you know, 
basically the area that they're working in was a little bit too long. The patient got some erythema after the procedure, but usually you don't see these. Stochastic effects um, are things like the risk of cancer, the main risk, risk of genetic hereditary changes, effects of the sperm and ova when you image over those regions. Uh, and the major risk is these stochastic effects and risk of cancer. And it usually takes about two to 25 years to develop. Um, the most accepted model for this is the no threshold model, meaning even one dose of an x-ray could cause a cancer down the road, but it's highly unlikely. So when we're talking about these, these are more probabilities. These are directly related to um, too much exposure and happen immediately. All right. Some uh, dose examples. Skin doses above two grays cause transient erythema only in a matter of hours. Um, usually the patients are fine. Skin dose above three gray causes transient epilation or hair loss. And a skin dose of over seven gray causes permanent epilation or hair loss. Um, just to talk about this, there was a case not that long ago at Cedar sinai where they're doing CT heads with perfusion protocols. And I don't think uh, the technologists or the radiologists were paying close attention to how much radiation was actually getting exposed to patients. And you had patients with radiation burns and hair loss. Um, so they had to work on those machines and figure out why the doses were so excessively high. No, but as we talked about, like, you know, three gray is transient. So I think they got transient. I don't think they got permanent. Yeah. I mean, this, 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 these are very large doses. I, I didn't really see any doses this high. Um, so stochastic effect, as I said, the main concern in diagnostic radiology, particularly the risk of cancer and neoplasm development. It's dependent uh, tremendously on age and sex, particularly age, because pediatric patients, uh, they're much more radiosensitive because they're growing, plus they have many more decades uh, to develop these kinds of cancers and uh, malignancies. Um, and the sex of the patient is also important. Uh, when I'm imaging a chest CT on a female patient, female patient has breast tissue that is much more radiosensitive um, than the male breast. Um, <clears throat> So effective dose um, is the term used for what we like to talk about is stochastic effects. So this is really uh, the dose that I think is the most important, but it's very hard to calculate. You not, it's not the absorbed dose. Basically, you have to take the absorbed dose and then multiply it times the tissue weighting factor for the organs that you image to try to get this dose. And this is not something that I would be able to do offhand. I'd have to work with a medical physicist give you an exact thing, and they would have helped me, help me based on the CT parameters or other things, figure out what the effective dose is. So my next slide, I'm going to um, basically talk about some of the effective doses, but these are estimates. Uh, and for the effective dose, we use the uh, Sievert. Uh, for just the regular dose, we use Gray. So effective dose for a Regular PA and lateral chest x-ray is 0.05 millisieverts, so it's very low. Um, the approximate uh, dose of radiation for a cross-country flight, say, from New York to LA is about 0.03 millisieverts, so very, very close. The key point here is the effective CT dose of a CT chest and a CT abdomen pelvis is 5 to 10 millisieverts, so between 100 and 200 times. Now, we do have newer CT techniques that have made this a little bit better, but it's still many more times the radiation dose uh, of a CT. Uh, I mean, the CT is many more times than the X-ray. Um, so the effective dose of a CT head is one or two millisieverts. Um, it, it, it's mainly because the, the tissue is less radiosensitive. Things like the neurons aren't actively dividing, so you have a much less risk. Uh, sometimes the skin dose can be higher uh, than these procedures because the calvarium or the skull is thicker, so you need a higher dose to penetrate and give you the resolution. But the main point here is because the head doesn't have as much radiosensitive tissue or critical organs, there's radiosensitive, that's why you're getting a, a lower effective dose on the CT head. Um, I hate to say then, it's about 100 times more exposure. 
It depends on who you talk to and what machine you're using and what manufacturer is using. I've heard 70, I've heard 100, I've heard 200. It depends on what. And if you're running a regular CT without contrast, that's going to be less dose. If you're running a CT with contrast, that's higher dose. And if you're running a CTA, that's even higher. So it depends also on the protocol. And the key thing with CTs is ordering the right study because you don't want to waste radiation. So if you're not only for PE studies, uh, should you use contrast, but the CTPEs, but you should probably use contrast for pneumonia studies or infectious workups or neoplastic studies if you're doing a metastatic workup um, because it it's sometimes can be a waste of radiation to not do the proper protocol and then have it ordered two days later or a week later or a month later. So I think that's the key point. Um, just protocol it. And a lot of times with CT, doing a with and without is unnecessary. Um, it's not like MRI where there's no radiation penalty and we want a with and without. With CT, we do not generally want a without and a with study, unless there are very small protocols that we do do that for, but I see it constantly being ordered. It's not correct. Uh, so um, these are just uh, some examples of fluoroscopy because another area of uh, major radiation exposure is uh, fluoroscopy studies. Uh, things like the upper G uh, GI series can run between 2 and 8 millisieverts. So again, it's pretty high. And a BE or contrast enema can run between 5 and 15 millisieverts. Now, these have gone, gone generally out of favor. <laughs> um, I, we really shouldn't be doing as many BEs sometimes as we are doing, but um, we do do them. Um, we can still do them, but again, they're not as good as CT colonoscopy or a lot of times like a CT with uh, contrast oral and IV. So I wanted to talk about the Image Gently campaign. So this was basically a uh, pediatric radiologist saw a significant rise in the amount of medical radiation exposure to patients, uh, pediatric patients, particularly from CT. And they started spearheading this campaign to try to make uh, clinicians aware of it. Um, it's mainly uh, they, the Society for Pediatric Radiology started working with the radiologists and, and I mean, the technologists in radiology and the physicists in fact, uh, radiology. And then uh, they got a tremendous amount of buy-in from the clinicians, the pediatric clinicians. And really thanks to you, this campaign has been largely successful. So the number of excessive CTs has significantly dropped. We are ordering more indicated studies. and um, uh, this was the main reason I actually went into pediatric radiology, was because we were much more effective in actually getting the right kind of study ordered, whether it be CT, X-ray, or ultrasound. The Image Wisely campaign um, is basically the adult equivalent. Um, it was started by the American College of Radiology and, again, worked with uh, technologists in radiology and medical physicists. Um, this campaign, again, was to raise awareness and has not been that successful. Um, there's generally been more pushback from the, uh, the adult clinicians, and we really haven't um, been able to control uh, the uh, use of CT very efficiently. Just to give you an example, inside my hospital, um, we had a patient, I think he was in his mid-40s, he had 150 CT scans in our institution alone. Um, mo I, I don't think there were any, any significant findings ever. Um, and we kept putting that in the reports, but they kept getting CTs for like headaches and stuff like that, um, <clears throat> or stone protocols. Now, that's a rare case. Um, and the guy, I think, had even more because it was a hospital adjacent to us, so he's probably going to too. But we tried to calculate his risk of cancer with the, uh, with the medical physicist we had. It was too high to calculate. But um, the, the main issue is not that. That's, I, I haven't seen any other patient with 150 CT scans. But what I do see all the time are patients who are young, and young is a relative term, but I, I think patients in the 40s and 50s are still young. because They definitely have 20 or you know, uh, 2 to 25 years left. Um, and a lot of those patients have over 20 CTs and 40 CTs. Personally, I've had two CT abdomen pelvises. One of them was indicated, one of them wasn't. I was too young when I didn't realize the one I had was unindicated. I went and tried to calculate my risk, but whatever. The bottom line is, is I, 
<laughs> I, it, it's fine if it's indicated. The main point is protocol it correctly. If you have any questions, always talk to us. Uh, I'll at least take the phone. That was my leukemia. I was getting CT scans to, you know, I just opened yesterday to whole body, whole body CT. The recommendation when you had a nodule was every three months. I got CT with contrast chest. This was about three or maybe four years ago. I think for two years. So I, I, I hope there's someone who's backing off of the uh, how aggressive. I mean, I think, I think they are starting to, and we're starting to use lower dose CT techniques. But in your case, if you if you legitimately have a reason and you have like a cancer and not just a lung nodule that's out of the blue. Um, that, that, that's medically indicated. So it's, it's a big difference than somebody, and that's why we use Fleischner criterion, I know you've probably seen it. Um, but that's the, that's the key thing between like a high risk patient and a low risk patient. Like somebody who has cancer is going to be exposed to more radiation because it's more indicated because you really, because you have to always weigh the pros and the cons of the procedure. Now we do have lower dose CT uh, techniques for lung nodule workups only, but those would not be sufficient for looking at things like mediastinal lymph nodes and hyalur lymph nodes for metastatic disease. Um, and just to give you an example, my father had a bunch of lung nodules on his CTPE study. He's a non-smoker. Some of them were seven millimeters, ended up being nothing, but had to keep being followed. So. All right. So some examples of reducing radiation. Um, a 3D head CT uh, for craniosynostosis. Uh, uh, cranio so this is basically 3D reformats or, uh, of the head CT. Go ahead. How is that better? It's better in that you get better resolution and you can actually see if there's real craniosynostosis. So with a plain film, the radiation is almost equivalent. And a lot of times you're hedging and you can't tell if there's craniosynostosis or not. But with these, you're getting about the same dose as x-rays, and it's much more diagnostic. Because the bone or the skull has much more intrinsic contrast, so you don't need high doses of radiation to see what you need to see. So that's why when you tailor it to what you're looking for, you can tremendously reduce dose. Um, avoiding uh, cystogram and nuclear medicine. Um, again, you would get the traditional fluoroscopic DCUG for initial reflux testing. But for, for repeat imaging, this actually might be a better study because it's lower radiation, and a lot of times it's more uh, sensitive because you're imaging the patient for longer, usually around 30 minutes. Um, another way of uh, saving radiation is basically a low-dose Q study or perfusion study with a chest X-ray for pregnant uh, females instead of a CTPE study. Um, Again, you kind of use the chest x-ray as your V or ventilation study, and if that's kind of negative where it doesn't look like they have a pneumonia, you can do this. And I've actually noticed a lot of the CTPE studies with pregnant females that are hyperventilating are almost non-diagnostic. So all I can exclude is a large central PE. I can't look at any of the peripheral vessels. So a lot of times you can also get more diagnostic studies. And you, you reduce radiation not only to the mother but also to the fetus. And of course, a duplex venous ultrasound. Um, this uh, is a no radiation penalty, and it's uh, it's not as dependent on the patient. So if the patient's hyperventilating, it doesn't matter. You can almost get a diagnostic study every time. Um, I've actually seen PE studies uh, for positive Holman sign or redness swelling inside the lower extremity. That's fine, but that doesn't mean that you don't have a DVT. So a lot of times the PEs I pick up are small subsegmental branches. The real DVT that's inside like a femoral vein or a popliteal vein is much larger and can cause much more damage. So really you should get a duplex ultrasound for that. Um, and that's no radiation penalty. Um, renal ultrasound for uh, flank pain. Um, of course, specifying which side they have flank pain if there's concern for stone. Um, a lot of times people get CT stone protocols or CT abdomen pelvises without contrast, and the patient has no hydro, no stone. You know, this would be a good screening tool, so you could eliminate a lot of that. Um, and the key point to this whole radiation talk, uh, ALARA principle 
for as low as reasonably achievable, uh, achievable a key principle towards using ionizing radiation. Um, and these are my references. Right. Questions? Question, okay. Ben, is a terrific talk. I was wondering, we have a lot of students and residents here. One of the things I've for years asked the students to do, because they don't always do a radiology rotation in their electives, they don't have the time to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think it's very helpful to know what is found and what is not found. And one of the useful things I tell them, go actually observe fluoroscopic studies. The goal is to minimize fluoro time, am I right there? And, and, and I think that just because you have a normal upper GI, some people extrapolate, oh, they didn't see reflux on upper GI, therefore they must not have reflux. And so I, I think it's helpful. Do you mind if the students come down with the patient to watch the floral studies and yeah. actually see how they're done? And actually, just you just reminded me of something I wanted to talk about, but I forgot to. On the upper GI series, um, on the, especially on the inpatient side, if we place an NG tube, I can minimize the radiation dose tremendously, because a lot of times these inpatients are sick, or even the patients who get outpatient are sick and the stomach's not moving well. So if we stick an NG, a lot of times I can get the stomach to empty more quickly so I can get more of a diagnostic study and minimize my fluoroscopic time and radiation dose. Go ahead. Great, thank you for that talk. Uh, you had mentioned that there has been some success with the Image Gently campaign and just wondering if there was some like numbers or some specifics you could quote in terms of outcomes. I mean, I don't know what the specific numbers were. I remember inside my pediatric fellowship that they talked about that the number of CTs had drastically been reduced. I can't give you an exact percentage off the top of my head, but it had been drastically reduced. Yeah. So I was wondering, um, why does lung atelectasis enhance on lung CT um, versus uh, lobar pneumonia? So the way you have to think about it is, is physiology. So atelectasis is still physiologic lung, so it's still going to be enhancing. Um, whereas with uh, airspace disease, most oftentimes pneumonia, it's not going to be enhancing because it's filled with things that shouldn't be there, either water, pus, blood, tumor, things like that. Um, and a lot of times you can have overlap between the two. So, so you could have a pneumonia, but you could also have an underlying neoplasm or malignancy too. So if you have a pneumonia that never clears up, that's bad. Been a, a question about interventional procedures. That's sort of been a change in the last couple of decades with the whole advent of IR, per se. Uh, in my specialty, the placement of PEGs, PEG-Js, uh, PICK lines, of course, NG, NJ, draining abscess, so forth. Can you comment to us on what falls underneath the pediatric radiology realm? In other words, in terms of what you mentioned, placing an NG, placing an NJ, versus what kind of falls under interventional radiology to give us some guidance as to what type of procedure and who we should ask, mm -hmm. depending upon what we would like, like uh, central venous access, pick lines, those kinds of things. Okay. So um, the, the general answer to that is interventional radiology is more like the surgical division of radiology. And they've actually split off from radiology. So in my time, you know, people who want to become interventionists, they had to go through a radiology residency and then uh, go uh, through diagnostic radiology and then be, go and subspecialize in IR. Now the two paths have been split even more. So interventional radiologists are the ones who generally do the procedures, things like pick lines, central lines, biopsies, um, what is it, peg line, uh, peg tubes, uh, any kinds of drains, uh, any kind of vascular procedure. Um, that's their major thing. Um, with most radiologists, I do thyroid biopsies and some lymph node biopsies, that's about it for procedures. That and, of course, fluoroscopic studies. But the interventionalists are really the ones that do the procedural heavy stuff. Um, so, Is that a separate board now? I think so, yeah. So, so for a lot of the people that was keeping them out of interventional radiology, I think those people are going to be happier because they don't have to do radiology anymore. They can just go and do, like, surgical radiology. Um, the thing that muddies the waters is people like my friend who's gotten into a body procedural fellowship, which a lot of people are doing, so they take some of the procedures from the interventionalists, but those are specialized radiologists. Not only are they reading body imaging, things like chest, ab, and pelvis, um, but they're also sometimes placing drains. Uh, and stuff like that. Any other questions in the room? We've got some time so I can unmute the phones. We've had quite a bit of people online. 
The conference is now in talk mode. If anyone on the line has a question, now's your chance. If you don't have a question, just please put your phone on mute so that... Uh... Can you comment on nuclear medicine uh, as a sort of separate area? Yeah. Do you do those? If you... I used to. Um, in my residency, we were very nuclear medicine heavy, and my uh, chairman was a radiologist and a nuclear medicine specialist. So we did a lot of those. Now I don't do any nuclear medicine. We only have a few of us that read nuclear medicine or are authorized to read nuclear medicine. But it is a tremendously important modality. It's not very clear <laughs> because of the way it's things, but I think that a lot of the future of radiology is basically taking some of the physiology from uh, nuclear medicine and overlaying it onto diagnostic imaging things like CTs and MRs, just with software, so you can get the physiologic overlaid over the nice diagnostic films. And you're starting to see that with things like PET MR and other things. Did someone on the line have a question? I heard someone talking. No? All right, one more question and then go ahead. I think we're oh. going to bring the mic. Um, I know I saw how you had mentioned, uh, you know, yeah, going back to the pneumonia, atelectasis, you know, obviously we, we have a lot of respiratory issues in pediatrics. Um, and I understand the benefit of the, you know, getting the CT with contrast um, versus the x-ray, uh, how useful are ultrasounds within that realm? Um, on, yeah. If Other than, obviously, you can see if there's a actual, like, uh, drainable, like, consolidation um, for, like, an effusion, but I don't know. Is there anything else that you can use that for or help differentiate things by utilizing um, it? There are people that say you can differentiate pneumonia from atelectasis when you have an effusion. Now, the thing you have to realize with ultrasound is you cannot penetrate through air. So you're not going to get diagnostic images, and it's not something I would generally use. Um, it, for pleural effusions, if you want to catch septations and stuff and some complexity, you can use ultrasound. But I would not use it to diagnose consolidation or pneumonia. And the key point is, is contrast helps us a lot of the time. It doesn't help us all times. And when I say airspace disease, then it becomes up to you, well, is this infectious or is this pulmonary edema, you know? Um, and then I'll use terms like mild airspace disease, or moderate, stuff like that. But um, it gives me, it's kind of like what you're talking about with nuclear medicine. When I get the contrast, I'm almost getting physiologic imaging. Like when I get a CT abdomen pelvis with IV contrast and say the patient has a stone, I can see that there's a delayed nephrogram on one side, so I can clearly see that that stone is obstructive. So. Um, there's been some controversy over the past decade or so with regards to our resident students rotating through the emergency room having a child with fever and, and pain mm -hmm. in terms of the appendicitis workup. I know for in the ER literature, um, about 10 years ago, there was a Hallmark article basically saying if you get a normal CT with contrast abdomen, that kid isn't going to come back to bite you for a real out of appendicitis. So it seemed like there was a lot of CTs being done, and certainly in our institution with you and with Dr. Stoker. I prefer to try ultrasound for appendicitis, but can you comment for the house staff and students on where do things stand in your opinion? If you were working in an ER doc uh, and you had, what is the utility of CT, ultrasound, and perhaps you make a comment about not just radiation but cost? Okay, so I completely agree. If you're significantly worried uh, about appendicitis, I would start off with an ultrasound in a pediatric patient. Um, it minimizes radiation. We're pretty good at them here. We, we have a pediatric hospital. Our sonographers are a little bit more, uh, most of them are more comfortable um, doing them. Uh, just to give you an example, inside my residency, I maybe saw, I don't know, four appendixes, <laughs> four years or something. Uh, it's because they're either almost always just getting a CT or getting an ultrasound and a CT ordered at the same time. And so the sonographers, couldn't find it and didn't want to find it. I mean, the patient was getting a CT anyway. So um, here, uh, you know, we, we generally do a much better job of finding them because our staff are more comfortable at doing them. Um, we have a pediatric ER, which is a little bit more effective at ordering things properly. Um, inside my fellowship, you know, we would find most of them with ultrasound. But 
you know, it just, if you don't find it, uh, it's also based on the clinical. So if the kids, uh, if you do the ultrasound, the kid's still screaming in pain, vomiting, not doing well, and it's tender, then you might want to move on to a CT. But a lot of times the white count is elevated or they have a shift. I've actually seen a bunch of times where the white count's not that high. Maybe it's around eight or something, but they have a leftward shift. So the diff actually helps too. And the physical exam helps a lot. <laughs> I'll just leave the mic. Yeah. Can you comment on the, the fact that the reality is a lot more ultrasounds are present everywhere that aren't in the radiologist's hands, in the ER physicians, and the, in terms of imaging the abdomen yeah. and so forth? Can you comment on, I mean, my, the two concerns that we have are uh, certainly the plus is the availability, the rapidity. The downside is false negatives, um, you know, and medical legal issues. Okay. Where do, I assume that the standard is for other things. You have family, family practice, resident delivery babies, they're held to the same standard, you know, from a medical legal standpoint as the most experienced obstetrician. Is that true yeah. in the imaging? If an if a ER doc calls a negative abdominal ultrasound, you say, oh, that, that, that clearly is an abnormal. Do you overread them or how does that usually work? Usually I don't because I don't usually know it was done. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, this was something that was actually happening inside uh, inside my fellowship where the ER, I think, was starting to read their own ultrasound. And um, having said, you know, we went through four years of residency just to read ultrasound. And ultrasound, it is tremendous, tremendously tech-dependent of whoever is taking the imaging. Um, so you can make almost anything look like anything. So if you have good images, Almost anybody can read it, but most of the time, you know, so it's, it, it becomes an art how to read it. And what was happening was the ER was making reads on some of the ultrasounds in the, in, their, in the ER, and the surgeons weren't trusting it, and they were coming back to us, not for a second read, because we would just do it in our department with our supervision. Um, Is that what you worried about the medical legal and the quality? The medical legal are two huge issues in this, in this field. What do we do here? Are, are, Having some kind of, we just, the ER physicians know they can have them overread or? I mean, I, I, I haven't had, I didn't, I wasn't aware that they were doing their own ultrasound, so I've. <laughs> well, it's not just for appendix, it's for. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, we've got that. So my view on that, you have a difference between a diagnostic ultrasound and then a screening, and I, I equate it to one day, you know, early on, you know, not everybody had a stethoscope, but now we do. And so we don't say, oh, that person with a stethoscope overread and they documented this. So just because you have a bedside ultrasound that shows something, you're going to have to get a diagnostic ultrasound in order to actually legally document that that's what's going on. So that's just, that's, that's my two cents. Well, I mean, and to that point, that's what I'm saying. I could say with a stethoscope, I heard this, but then, you know, you're going to get, if you're worried about some pathologic murmur, you're going to get an echocardiogram, you're going to get something more confirmatory. So I guess you're asking, is that going to lead to more um, ionizing radiation being performed because of a false negative on an ultrasound? Normal. Kid goes home, perforates, dies. The lawyer says, "Who, who read this ultrasound?" As you correctly point out, the, the training level. Yeah. That's my. That was my concern. Sure. Uh, that was my understanding. What are they? They're they're ultrasounding everything. Like it, like it's too, I think it's almost part of the vital signs. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm I partly don't know joking, if I agree with kind that. Of not really. I don't know I mean, if I agree with that, but you know, I had a, I had an attending inside my fellowship no, it, who was like, who was like, oh, we should just MRI every patient head to toe, and I was like, everybody was. No, it, I mean it, <laughs> it, it happens. It happens very frequently, and. And if there is something that they think is positive, then absolutely they get a dedicated radiology ultrasound. Um, but I, sometimes I do worry about the, the, you know, ED intern is doing a bedside ultrasound and, oh, it looks fine. And so that's kind of, that thing on the differential is, is no longer 
um, something that's seriously considered. And that's, that's not universal, but, um, but I, I think it does happen. I know they didn't have a radiologist there. Yeah. Uh, until the same quality as if you did it, and that's not. I think that's a, that's where I raise. raise the yeah. So I, I think it's I think it can be helpful if if used in the correct setting and um, with the the mindset that this is strictly just a screening thing, but. Even if it's negative, if you're still clinically worried about appendicitis or something like that, then you do need a, an official, dedicated radiology done ultrasound. I, I just but, diagnostically and saving that. That, 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 that's the point to the house staff and the students is I, I want to put a plug in for you because the, this in our institution. I mean, I, I, for a personal standpoint, my granddaughter had perfect appendix in Lynchburg, and I had to go over there. The CT was negative. The adult surgeon said it was negative. Said, you know, I'm at 10 o'clock, go over there, feel her belly. She's got peritonitis. So Stoker did an ultrasound for me at 10 o'clock, and she was in the OR, and bingo, she'd already perfect. But um, that's the difference, as you correctly point out. I want to get the plug in for our, our team and our house staff. It's so much operator dependent, in my opinion. The, the ultrasound tech and the radiologist makes a world of difference. Absolutely, you know, and, and, and I just want to put in a plug for Tom Stoker, because um, he's the other pediatric radiologist, and he was actually trained in sonography. So the sad thing about most radiology training nowadays is they don't train us in sonography. So I would say about two-thirds of programs, we're not actually learning how to scan. The only time I really got to scan inside my residency was when I was doing biopsies, and I would control the whole thing myself when I was doing thyroid biopsies, breast biopsies, or lymph node biopsies. So that was the only time, or some IR procedures. But a lot of the radiologists nowadays, we are not taught to scan, so we're reliant on the technologists to give us diagnostic images and where they're putting the, the, the you know, the, the, the transducer to mark where it is in the human body. So. Uh, a big difference between here and inside my fellowship, on any complex cases, I would be called into the room. Here, a lot of times with the volumes, I don't even get to, a chance to go examine the patient myself and actually scan myself. So, um, but the bottom line is, is I think it's probably to a higher quality with a radiologist as opposed to maybe somebody else who's operating an ultrasound machine. Right, we got one more. One I just, more well, I just wanted uh, to uh, comment on. Uh, Non-radiologists also. There are there are situations I think where it can be helpful if you're doing an IND of an abscess, and you want to see where that abscess is and how big it is. Um, starting IVs, um, things like that, it can be helpful. But certainly, if uh, you're worried about appendicitis or um, something like that, then then having a radiologist do the ultrasound is is a good idea. It's 8:30, so I think uh, we're going to wrap up. Thank, Thank you all very much for really joining us. Uh, if you're still online and you had a question, you can always People like you email us at outreach at curlingclinic.org, and we'd be happy to get them <laughs> to Dr. Fahar today. Uh, with that, we're going to go ahead and disconnect the phone oh, really lines nice now. Thank you all very much for joining us. Oh, yeah.